All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Greta Zaro. I'm the organizing director with World Beyond War. I'm excited to join you tonight and to provide some tech uh, behind the scenes. I'll also be with my colleague, Mark Elliott Stein. So you can contact uh, Mark or myself if you have any tech needs throughout this webinar. Um, some Zoom logistics before we get started. Uh, we have enabled the closed captioning tonight. If you need the closed captioning, you can click on the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to to enable the captions. You can also click on the CC button if you want to disable the captions. The captions are automatically generated by robots, so please excuse any errors. We are also recording this webinar and we will send out the recording afterward. If you have to leave early, don't worry, we will email it to all the registrants. And please use the chat box throughout the webinar if you have any questions or comments or anything else. And with that, I will turn it over to Barbara to kick us off. Good evening, all. I'm Barbara Phytos with the Florida Peace and Justice Alliance. Honored to have you all with us this evening for this wonderful web webinar featuring Bill McKibben. Uh, FPGA was founded on the premise that there is strength in collaboration. We are obviously based out of the state of Florida, and our intent is to work diligently to collaborate with like-minded organizations and individuals that unite our strengths and resources to advance peace building and justice. We understand that there's an interrelatedness of all issues such as what we're experiencing in the climate crisis, the issue of militarism, the issue of racism, economic inequalities and inequities. These all can be addressed and interconnected uh, always with a nonviolent theme. So we are honored to present tonight um, this really, really exciting webinar. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our founding co-chair, Al Mitty. Uh, who will introduce our keynote speaker this evening. Thank you all again for being with us. Thank you, Barbara. And before I introduce Bill, and it's an honor to do that, uh, I'm gonna make a few comments about, uh, about, about this interconnectedness that Barbara mentioned. Um, on April 4th, 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous Beyond Vietnam speech at Riverside Church in New York City. Besides providing compelling reasons for ending the insane and immoral war against Vietnam, Dr. King also used the occasion to summon the nation to, quote, undergo a radical revolution of values, unquote, that would transform the United States from a, quote, thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. Only through such a revolution, he declared, would we be able to overcome the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism. Those triplets of racism, materialism, and the poverty that results from it, and war, which the US and other countries have perpetuated against the, across the globe, continue. Frighteningly, frighteningly, however, to those three evils of racism, poverty, and war, we must now add ecocide, the destruction of the world around us. These evils are all interconnected, racism against people of color, poverty that impacts people of color overwhelmingly compared to white people, wars in which poor people of color die while the affluent protected peoples perpetuate <coughs> wars. These evils, war, racism, poverty, and ecocide are interconnected. Now much of the world is focused on the war in Ukraine, the thousands killed and the millions of refugees and the food shortages are horrible and senseless. But we hear very little about the environmental devastation and the fossil fuels burned and wasted. What we do hear about is how Europe and the rest of the world will find access to more fossil fuels, and we hear about the boycotts of Russian fuels. Early in the news about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, our US news focused on the status of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 natural gas pipelines from Russia to Germany. And we considered lifting the sanctions 
against Venezuelan oil and encouraged Iran to increase production of oil. We did so not because we were concerned about freedom and security for Ukrainians or because we have changed our minds about the inhumanity of sanctions, but because the US was concerned about the price of pump, the price at the pump for gasoline here in the US. And now the US will be spending at least 40 billion more on weapons to escalate the war in Ukraine when we know that for just $30 billion, we could end starvation on earth. But it doesn't matter that we spend another 40 billion on top of the trillions we've spent on war. Our grandchildren will pay for it if we're kind enough to leave them an inhabitable planet. Now three months into the Russian invasion and what has become a proxy war between the US and, and NATO allies aimed at weakening Russia, regime change in Russia, and a US and NATO victory over Russia, the world should be alarmed by the potential of nuclear war. But even without a nuclear disaster, the world is experiencing yet another war where fossil fuel guzzling machines kill humans and demolish buildings and infrastructure and billions of gallons of fossil fuel will be burned to restore the communities and homes destroyed by this war. Dr. King taught us how racism, war, and poverty are connected. So is ecocide, the destruction of our planet. He called for a radical revolution of values. We have not listened to him. And now it's my privilege and honor to, uh, to introduce Bill McKibben. Uh, Bill McKibben is, the contributing, is a contributing writer to The New Yorker and a founder of Third Act, which organizes people over the age of 60 to work on climate and racial justice. So when I get to be over the age of 60, I'm going to be very interested in that. Um, he founded, that was a joke, um, he founded the first global grassroots climate campaign 350.org and serves as the Schumann Distinguished Professor in Residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. In 2014, he was awarded the Right Livelihood Prize, sometimes called the Alternative Nobel in the Swedish Parliament. He's also won the Gandhi Peace Award and honorary degrees from 19 colleges and universities. He has written over a dozen books about the environment, including his first, The End of Nature, published in 1989, and the forthcoming, The Flag, the Cross, and the Station Wagon. A graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened. So Bill, we'll turn it over to you and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, well. Al, thank you very much, and Barbara as well. It's a pleasure to be with you all, um, and I hope things are well down in the Sunshine State. Um, I gather from looking at the news that at least Sarasota and Fort Lauderdale set new temperature records for the day-to-day, -day, so I imagine it's somewhat warm, and I imagine you know to expect somewhat more of that going forward. I'm going to talk, I'm going to start by talking about energy for a while and then link it back up to these other subjects we're talking about. And I'm going to talk about some very optimistic um, news about energy uh, to kind of set the groundwork here. Um, as Al said, I did write the first book about climate change back when I was in my 20s, back in the 1980s. And at the time, we basically knew what we know now about climate change, that burning coal and gas and oil um, puts carbon in the atmosphere, that this molecular structure traps heat that would otherwise radiate back out to space. What we didn't know in 1989 was exactly what we were going to do about it, uh, what we were going to replace coal and gas and oil with. And happily, Engineers and scientists have done a remarkable job over the last couple of decades 
uh, over the last 10 years alone, they've dropped the price of solar power and wind power about 90%. Uh, and the batteries to store that power when the sun goes down or the wind dies are on a similar trajectory. So renewable clean energy is now the cheapest way to generate power in most of the world, including most of the US. I just want you to bear that in mind so that you'll know that none of the rest of what I'm going to say to you is abstract or far-fetched or pie in the sky. Um, we're talking about things that are powerfully possible to accomplish. Not easy. We have to rejigger the energy system that's at the heart of our economy. And as I'll note later, not easy because vested interest in, gets in the way, but by no means um, technically or financially impossible to imagine. So that's where I'll, I just want you to have that in your mind as I begin. So now let me talk about fossil fuel for a moment and about why we should be so wary of it. And I'm going to give you a, 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 a few reasons that will eventually feed directly into this discussion of war and peace in the Ukraine. Um, the first thing to be said about fossil fuel, and something that we don't say often enough, is that even if it wasn't warming the planet, the effects of fossil fuel combustion are extremely, extremely dangerous for people all over the earth. It was finally a real solid big meta study last year of all the data on the combustion of fossil fuel and the pollution it produces. And they concluded that forget climate change, just breathing the byproducts of fossil fuel combustion kills about 9 million people annually on this planet. 9 million is a lot. It's more than COVID and HIV AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis and war and terrorism combined on this planet. It's the, depending how you count it, the second or third leading cause of death on Earth. It's heavily concentrated among poor people and people of color because they're living in the places that we've often designated as sacrifice zones, next to the highway, next to the refinery, next to the power plant. That's why asthma rates for African Americans are three times the rate for white Americans. And the same thing is true all over the globe. And as I've indicated before, all of this is now unnecessary. We don't know how to stop all cancer, but we know how to stop all the deaths that come from breathing the byproducts of fossil fuel combustion. Um, we need to end that combustion and as I was saying, it's now possible to imagine doing it. The human career of 200,000 years of setting stuff on fire has now reached a point where it can and should come very quickly to an end. And where we should be turning out the fires under the hoods of our cars and replacing them if we need to drive a car with an electric vehicle, we should be turning out the fires that are in, in our furnaces and replacing them with electric heat pumps. Uh, uh, we should be turning off the um, fires that are in our kitchens and replacing that blue gas flame with magnetic induction cooking, um, all of which is affordable, workable, almost always better than whatever it's replacing. Um, we could, instead of setting stuff on fire, rely on the fact that the good Lord was kind enough to place a large ball of burning gas about 93 million miles away in the sky. And we now have the wit to make full use of it. And so we should. So that's reason number one. The reason number two, that we all are well aware of, perhaps Floridians more than most Americans, is um, what the implications are as our climate continues to warm. Climate change is by far the biggest thing that humans have ever done. Nothing else that we've ever done even comes close to the damage that we're talking about now. So far, human beings have raised the temperature of the planet about one degree Celsius, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or so, which doesn't sound like an enormous amount. So measure it in other units that may make it clearer. Um, the extra heat we trap each day 
from the carbon that we've put in the atmosphere. Each day is the heat equivalent of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized explosions. So viewed in those units, it gets easier to understand the scale of change that we have managed to kick off. Most of the sea ice in the summer Arctic is now melted. If you go back and look at those, there may not be anybody else here old enough to remember like I can, those first pictures coming back from the Apollo missions of what our planet looked like from outer space, but you've seen them probably. Um, and, and they were beautiful and powerful, and they're now as out of date as my high school yearbook picture. Um, it doesn't look like that anymore. Most of the white up top is gone. Um, um, and with it, extraordinary changes happening in our hemisphere. Uh, with open water in the Arctic, the jet stream has entered into an erratic and destabilized phase that results in these very long periods of either drought or flood, depending on what side you find yourself on. And these extraordinary incursions of hot air up north to Canada. Last June, uh, the temperature in, uh, in Canada went to 121 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than it's ever been in South America or in Europe. Um, and the extraordinary uh, uh, intrusion of cold air down into the lower 48 to wit Texas's ice event of the winter before last. Um, you all know about the kind of changes that are going on. Um, look, the, the single most maybe most important physical fact of, of our century is that warm air holds more water vapor than coal. And so in arid areas, you get um, more evaporation, hence more drought, and when the temperature is high, the extraordinary fires that we now see summer after summer after summer across the American West, and sometimes across parts of the Southeast, including Florida. Uh, mostly though in our region, since we tend to be wetter, uh, uh, the other half of this law applies. Once that water is evaporated up in the atmosphere, it's going to come down and increasingly comes down in torrents on a scale that we've never seen before. So just across the Gulf in Houston three years ago now, Hurricane Harvey produced the greatest rainstorm in American history. Five feet of water fell on some places. Up in the Northview in the Carolinas that next year, uh, uh, one hurricane produced the second largest rainstorm in American history. It dumped the equivalent of all the water on Chesapeake in Chesapeake Bay on the Carolinas in the course of 36 hours. Um, last, uh, last summer, I happened to be in New York City when the remains of Hurricane Ida came up from the Gulf and, and dropped so much rain that it drowned more New Yorkers than it had um, killed people in Louisiana. Um, um, people drowned in their basement apartments. And of course, those were the poorest and most vulnerable people in New York. Um, I could go on listing crises like this for a long time. You all are well aware of the, what may be the most salient of all, the increasingly rapid rise in the level of the oceans, which is causing sunny day flooding now um, in much of coastal Florida. And if you have any doubts about it, just check with your insurance agent um, about uh, uh, what people are thinking is going to be happening um, going forward. Um, suffice it to say that we're still sadly fairly near the beginning of this greenhouse experiment. On current trajectories, we're going to raise the temperature of the planet about three degrees Celsius, five, six degrees Fahrenheit. If we do that, we will not be able to have civilizations anything like the ones we're used to. There's just too much violent flux and chaos in those numbers. The UN estimates that could produce a billion climate refugees. So look at 4 million climate refugees who have left the Ukraine um, and the strain that that's caused across whole continents and now multiply it by 250 times and start trying to figure out what that world looks like. Um, um, the cost would be beyond our ability to deal with. The most recent estimates I've seen for unchecked global warming this century indicate a price tag of about $550 trillion, which is more money than currently exists on planet Earth. Um, 
So our job is not to stop global warming. It is too late for that. Uh, it is to do everything we can to hold it to two degrees or less, aim for 1.5 degrees Celsius. That will take everything that we've got. And the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that to reach the targets we set in Paris just seven years ago, we would need to cut emissions by half by 2030. That is seven years from now. So it's on the bleeding edge of the technically possible, but it's going to take everything that we've got to get them. Among other things, it's going to take attention and focus like we have not paid before. And that's one place where the war in Ukraine may be a salutary phenomenon. Um, and here I go to the third reason why I think we should be doing everything we can to get off fossil fuel just as fast as we can. And that's because fossil fuel by its nature tends to produce autocrats. Um, and if you think about it for a little while, it becomes fairly obvious why. Um, coal and gas and oil are scattered in a few deposits around the planet. These are highly concentrated deposits of coal or gas or oil. And so the people who live on top of them or otherwise have control of them end up with an extraordinary amount of um, unearned power. In our country, our biggest oil and gas barons are the Koch brothers, who had control, have control of most of the nation's pipeline system. And they've used, as you know, their winnings from that um, fortune to purchase one of our political parties and degrade and deform our political life in astonishing ways. In Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, it's the king of Saudi Arabia, Jared Kushner's best friend, who is um, the beneficiary of the fact no one pays attention to Saudi Arabia because they have some interesting idea about the world. I mean, these are rulers that cut off the heads of their opponents with swords, you know, um, but we pay attention to them because they've got a lot of oil. And Vladimir Putin is probably the best example of this. Um, his army is entirely funded by fossil fuel. If you have any doubt about that, go look around your house and try to find something of Russian manufacture that you might want to boycott or whatever. Unless you have an old bottle of Stolichnaya sitting in the liquor cabinet, I'm willing to wager you're not going to find much of anything that comes from Russia. 60%, 60% of their export earnings come from selling oil and gas. They are essentially just a big gas station. And, and not only does that where their money comes from, that's where much of their political power comes from. For 20 years, they've been able to keep Western Europe cowering, even though there's no doubt about what kind of sick thug Putin is. And this is a man who's poisoned his opponents one after another, uh, tossed them out windows. Uh, 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 he's, he's as bad as they come. But it's been very hard for Germany or France or anyone to really stand up to him because his threat to turn off the tap uh, for their gas supplies has been very real and very strong. By contrast, a world that ran on fossil fuel would not be subject to the same kind of um, autocratic control. That's because sun and wind exist pretty much everywhere. You all have an extraordinary supply, especially of the former um, um, down there in Florida. That's, I believe, why you call it the Sunshine State. Um, and, and so you could be producing huge amounts of energy without ever having to send a check off to Saudi Arabia or Russia or the Koch brothers or anybody else. This is not utopian. There's going to be people who get rich building solar panels and they'll have outsized political power, but they're not going to get Exxon rich. And that's the thing to understand about renewable energy. Once you build a solar panel, once you put it up, then it stands there for the next 25 years and the energy is just delivered every morning when the sun rises above the horizon. That's completely different business model from the fossil fuel industry, which has kept us all writing our checks every month for our entire lives for the next delivery of whatever it is. 
And, and that's why the exons of the world hate renewable energy so much, um, um, because it defies their business model. They don't like electric cars, um, certainly, especially ones that run off the power that's coming from the roof or coming from the solar farm at the edge of town or, or wherever it is. Um, so as a blow to autocracy, it's a very powerful idea. I've spent much of the, um, some of the last month or two back and forth with my good friend in Ukraine, Svetlana Romanko, a veteran climate campaigner who I've known for a long time. And we've done a number of appearances and things together, uh, you know, as the bombs fall outside her uh, apartment. Um, and her extraordinary bravery and the great bravery of all those around her, and people who are standing up in all the ways they can to uh, uh, the second biggest military machine on the planet. Um, she keeps saying, tell people in the West that fossil fuels are a weapon of mass destruction. And I think that that's a really important way to say this. We would not be standing on this particular nuclear precipice uh, if, if we lived in a world that ran on sun and wind because there would be a whole different set of players uh, in, in motion. And, and that is true in many, many, many ways. Look, if we're going to build out renewable energy, it's going to take a certain amount of mining and things to make it happen. We need lithium, cobalt, and so on. But understand, as I said before, that once you've done that once, then the solar panel's there for a quarter century. It's not like coal or gas where you dig it up, burn it, and then have to dig it up again. The way to think about this is that 40% of all the ship traffic in the world is simply carrying fossil fuels back and forth around the planet. That is, if we were running things on sun and wind, we'd cut by 40% the amount of ship traffic, and we'd cut by about 80% the total amount of mining activity on the planet. Those are extraordinary ways to think about the world with a lot less friction and a lot less places for things to go very, very awry. Um, the alternative is a world with ever more sources of friction. As you know, the combination of war in the Ukraine and uh, a series of climate-induced events that are reducing harvests around the world this year are causing food prices to skyrocket. Now, that's not a huge problem for most of us, you know. If a box of raisin bran costs 40% more, well, we'll probably survive. But it is a life and death situation for many, many billions of people around the world who live very close to the margin and for whom the price of wheat going up 40% as it has already this year is the most important thing that will happen in their lives this year. Uh, and the most destabilizing and the most likely to lead to conflict and war place after place after place. So, the world that we need to build is a world that runs on different forms of energy and hence is a safer, more secure, more just place. A couple of things to add before I stop. One, unlike our other problems that we face, this one is a timed test. If we don't solve it soon, then we don't solve it. It's not like health care, you know, it's absurd that America doesn't have a healthcare system like the rest of the industrialized world. Someday with the great leadership of people like my old friend Bernie, we'll probably get there. And the fact that we didn't do it for the last 40 years won't in the end make it harder to get there. A lot of people will have died in the meantime or gone bankrupt and that's sad, but it will not prevent us from doing it. But climate change isn't like that. If we don't solve it soon, then we never solve it. No one has a plan for freezing up the Arctic again once it's melted. So it's incredibly important that we take seriously the absolute radical urgency of all of this. And that means that we need to figure out how to move most effectively to try and make change happen. 
you would think that given the magnitude of the problem that we face and the magnitude and the availability of the solutions that the engineers have given us, that this is mostly what we'd be at work on in this world and in this country. But we're not mostly at work on it is largely the fact of extreme vested interest. Inertia plays a part as well, but inertia is, I think, overcomable if there aren't also backing it up the extraordinary power of the fossil fuel industry. We've built big movements over the last 10 years, and that's helped. We're closer than we've ever been, but not close enough. Look at Washington. Uh, the president's very commendable climate bill, the Build Back Better bill, has 49 votes in the U.S. Senate, which is pretty remarkable. It's much closer than we've ever come before. But the 50th vote, because none of the Republicans are going to cooperate, belongs to Joe Manchin. And he's taken more money from the fossil fuel industry than anyone else in D.C. Not an easy title to win, but he won it. And the return on their investment has been staggering. And he's been able to block hundreds of billions of dollars in money that's desperately needed to jumpstart this, um, this clean energy revolution. And so we have to figure out how to stand up to these guys. We've organized big campaigns that have begun to do that. Uh, sometimes we've managed to block infrastructure. The 10-year campaign to beat the Keystone Pipeline um, was probably the signal example of that, but it spawned a hundred other similar fights here and around the world. Uh, the fossil fuel divestment movement, um, which Naomi Klein and I began a decade ago, is now at $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have uh, um, divested their holdings from coal or oil or gas. Um, it's the largest anti-corporate campaign of its kind in history. And many thanks to those of you who I'm sure have helped out with this in one way or another. Um, now, much of the attention is focused on trying to push the rest of the financial system, especially the big banks. I published an interesting piece in the New Yorker on Friday uh, with the details of a brand new report that makes it clear just how big that impact is. This report looked at what the effect, how much carbon cash in our banking system produces. Our four biggest banks in this country, Chase, Citi, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, are also the four biggest lenders to the fossil fuel industry in the world. So the, the report began by looking at the big, big corporations that have a lot of cash in the, in, in, in how much carbon that cash produces just when they leave it sitting in their bank accounts. And what they found was that, say, Google's carbon emissions go up 111%, more than double, when you include this new measure. Uh, Facebook, more than that. Uh, Apple, 70% up, you know, on and on and on. But the same numbers can also be used somewhat crudely to calculate um, um, what people in their own bank accounts produce. If you have, it turns out, $125,000 saved in the banking system, uh, that's producing more carbon than everything an average American does in an average year. All the cooking, driving, flying, heating, and cooling. <clears throat> because it's being lent out to build pipelines and LNG terminals and on and on and on. So that's why we're working so hard at the moment to target banks. And this is one of the projects that this new third act group has undertaken. It's a particularly useful job for those of us over the age of 60, because fairly or not, we ended up with most of the money. Uh, the baby boomers and the silent generation above them have about 70% of the country's financial assets compared with about 5% for millennials. So if we're going to pressure the banks, it's going to take us doing it. And I hope that people will go to thirdact.org and sign the pledge there to cut up your credit cards from these banks at year's end if we haven't made real progress with them um, and, and move accounts and things. It's, it's 
it's not that hard to do compared with the other things that we need to do. It, it, you know, it, and the scale of the damage, it's relatively easy and very important. And it's been great fun to see that organizing going on. Um, um, just yesterday or day before, a bunch of our third act groups around the country um, um, have been uh, demonstrating outside banks. And we're here in Vermont, uh, in Burlington, outside the Chase Bank, under a big banner that said fossils against fossil fuels. And uh, it was a, a good, good picture for the newspaper. And before the day was done, a bunch of kids from the high school had come down to join in. Young people are really doing this work and in great ways. You all know about Greta Thunberg, and you should. Greta's fantastic, one of my favorite people. But um, there's 10,000 Greta Thunbergs around the world, and they have 10 million followers. And that's great. Young people are idealistic and, and energetic and committed and smart. But it's not fair to take the most difficult problems in the world and assign them to 17 year olds. You know, say, tell them to save the planet in between algebra homework and field hockey practice. You know? um, they need the backup of those of us who have political power and economic power. And that's why I'm very hopeful that you all will mobilize to help in this third act effort that we've got going. But however you organize to help, I, I, I guess the point that I've been trying to make is that I think that this question of fossil fuel is absolutely central to where we are. Um, and, 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 and is the single most practical way to move very, very quickly uh, uh, down the path that we need to move on. It, if we went there, it would cause extraordinary change in ways that people don't ordinarily think about, including around these areas like autocracy. And I'll just finish by saying that um, this is the, I think, the challenge of our lifetime in the way that fighting fascism in Europe was the challenge uh, of our grandparents' time. And whereas they had to cross the Atlantic and kill or be killed in order to do that job, we have a much um, more benign task. Our job is to work with people around as much of the world as we can to save as many lives as we can, as quickly as we can. But it's going to take some of the same spirit of sacrifice and focus and really willingness to work. I was in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago and got to go to the World War II Museum, which I highly recommend you if you're in uh, the Crescent City anytime soon. It's quite remarkable. And the most remarkable part for me were the rooms devoted to the home front during the war and the ways that Americans sacrificed, uh, 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 made enormous changes in order to help that war effort. Um, I'm sad that no one's called upon us to do almost any of that now. A very useful way to be helping the, the brave people of Ukraine would be for us to be using a lot less energy right now because that would drive the price down and drive down the oversized receipts that Vladimir Putin's enjoying as the price of oil spikes. We could and should be using the Defense Production Act, uh, which Biden doesn't need Manchin's sign off to use, to do things like build millions of air source heat pumps and deliver them to Europe to get them installed in apartments before it gets cold again in October in Germany and Putin's weapon of choice, his control of the gas supply, becomes more salient. Um, in fact, it's going to take an effort equivalent to the one that America put in at the beginning of World War II. It's the only, it's the only example we have in our history of a concentrated burst of effort on the scale that we would need to quickly change energy systems. And this time it would be in the name of something very different. So I, I, I think that it's, um, I think that it's a powerful moment right now where many of these things are drawn into high relief by what's happening 
in Ukraine, and it may actually be the last of these kind of potentially transformative moments that we have in the relevant time frame before physics just overtakes us in dealing with climate change becomes mathematically unlikely. So I'm going to end there and just look at some of the questions that are here in the chat um, and, and try and answer them a little bit. But David asks, wasn't it true that um, in terms of the major corporations, it was the insurance industry that was the first to acknowledge global warming? Yes, to some degree, especially the European insurance industry and the great reinsurers, Swiss Re, Munich Re, and things have been talking about it for a long time. Sadly, it hasn't changed the operations of the insurance industry as a whole, which continue to invest huge amounts of money in fossil fuel, and even more critically, continue to underwrite things like the fossil fuel pipelines. Um, and if they didn't, then we couldn't keep building this new fossil fuel infrastructure. There's been a lot of work. Uh, a group called Insure Our Future has been at the forefront of it to take on the insurance industry. We found out just the day before yesterday that one of the biggest insurers, Marsh McLennan, is insuring the new East Africa crude oil pipeline, which combines all the worst features of climate crime with all the worst features of colonialism. Um, um, so this beat unfortunately goes on, but the insurance is a good pressure point. Uh, uh, so, uh, Al says, with the U.S. military being the largest single user of fossil fuel, can we successfully fight climate change without tremendously shrinking the U.S. military? Um, well, it's true that the U.S. military is the biggest user of fossil fuel in the world of any organization, but it's worth looking a little more closely at those numbers because it gives you a good sense really of where why this is such a difficult problem. The US military uses more fossil fuel than anybody else, but they only use about one and a half percent of the world's supply, um, leaving 98 and a half percent to account for. And if you think about it for a while, you can really understand why that is. I mean, just picture in your mind those pictures of every commuting day at every um, um, big city in the world with that line of cars going in and out day after day after day, each of them spewing fossil fuel into the atmosphere. Look, big transport planes and tanks and things use a lot of energy, but nothing like what we use day in, day out. The real story, I think, with the military is that it's been used to defend our access to that fossil fuel decade after decade after decade. That's been its main job. And, and so, getting off fossil fuel plays the pleasant side benefit of reducing the need to be performing that function um, um, uh, uh, and, and the perceived need for having an oversized military. Um, um, you're right, this would be a good source of funds, as David points out, for a Green New Deal to be to reduce the military budget. But I'm my prediction is that it would be hard to continue to reduce the military uh, to the point where we are no longer reliant on fossil fuel. Bill, I think we've lost you. Nope. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you not hear me? Okay, you're back now. Oh, good. It says your yeah. bandwidth is a little bit low. I'm sure it is. That's part of life out here in the countryside. Um, um, uh, I was just saying that uh, uh, that one of the things that makes political change difficult all the time is the incredible political salience of the price of gas. It's at six dollars a gallon in places now. It means that nobody's paying any attention to lots of other more important things. It'll be a beautiful day when everybody's driving an electric vehicle if they have to drive anything at all, because then, well, the sun's delivering electricity for the same price it did a week ago and it'll be the same a year from now, and, and that'll be gone anyway. Um, um, Alice is, 
how do you see the peace movement working together with the environmental movement and those working for racial justice? Well, as I've tried to say, I think that it's all the same basic task and that this task of getting off fossil fuel is key to all those, uh, on all those fronts. I can think of nothing that contributes more towards rejiggering the political arrangements of the planet and nothing that as quickly takes at least some of the pressure off uh, uh, the most vulnerable communities in the world, mostly communities of color, and nothing, of course, that slows down the absolutely existential risk of climate change. Um, Kia asks, do you advocate a supply only solution replacing fossil fuel energies with alternatives? Um, um, and are there, are there ways to deal with the demand, to confront the demand side of this problem in the short run? Look, we should definitely be using less energy, and there's plenty of ways to do that. Um, um, we're using one of them right now. Uh, Zoom is an interesting new technology that allows us to think differently about the world. I would caution that in the short run, I think it's going to be difficult to really radically restructure daily life in America or the rest of the world in the period of time that scientists have given us to deal with climate change. So while we're working on conservation and efficiency, it's also gonna be really necessary to electrify as much of our daily life as possible, and then to use uh, clean energy to do that. If we do it, we'll save a ton of money as long as we're saving a ton of lives. Uh, it's not a free lunch, and we need to be as careful as we can about how we mine, what we need to mine to make that happen and things. But when we talk about climate change, we're not talking about another problem on a list of problems. We're talking literally about the existence of the world as human beings have known it as long as human history has stretched. And we're going way outside the bounds of that history now. The CO2 level in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, as of today, is 421 parts per million. That's higher than it's been in many millions of years. So we're in completely dangerous existential territory right now. David asks, what do we do about the battery problem? Aren't there environmental problems with lithium iron? As I said, there are environmental problems with everything. Um, there's nothing we do in this world that doesn't create environmental problems. There's, you know, nine billion of us are so crowded in here, and and so whatever we do causes trouble. But the good news is, as I say, that the total mining burden on the planet drops about eighty percent as we move towards renewables. Um, and that's a useful thing to keep in mind, even as we're working to make that mining we do need to do as humane and environmentally sound as it's possible to get at. Um, and, uh, um, I think Rivers offers perhaps less a question than a uh, 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 critique um, uh, and, uh, and urges people to get together and truly organize against the war machine. So good idea, uh, uh, on we go. Um, um, I'll just say that big organizing is hard work um, and, and we'll all be good at, you know, Rivers, everybody else will be very good at this, I'm sure. Um, um, but don't underestimate the um, uh, uh, amount of work that it requires as you build out these kind of campaigns. Um, and it'll be fun to watch and uh, deal with it. Cindy, Cindy asks, how do we deal with the deniers? Um, uh, and there's information bubble in parts of Florida. Indeed, there is. And there's no perfect answer to this question, Cindy. Um, I, I offer a couple of things. I think that we've basically won the fight on public opinion 
or at least done better than we've done in the past. We're up to the point where 70% of Americans are willing to say that climate change is a real problem and that we need to do something about it. And you get a sense that that holds true at least a little bit, even in Florida, where Governor DeSantis did a pushed hard by people, did what may be about the only useful thing he's ever done a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, with that solar bill um, that, that he made sure it didn't happen. That's a sign of the kind of good organizing people have been doing. In general, I think it's very difficult to convince the last 30% of deniers uh, uh, out there. Um, it's, they're not waiting for another graph or chart or article from nature or something. Um, um, they're ideologues. And if you had spent the last 30 years marinating in Rush Limbaugh, you'd be an ideologue too, and it would be difficult for you to you know, change your mind. So I always tell young people, from talking to them in the fall, I always say, do not ruin Thanksgiving arguing with your crazy uncle about climate change because it's not going to help. But do sit down next to your sweet aunt at some point, and who's probably worried about the world her grandchildren are inheriting, and try and get her moved into the slightly more active category here. Our problem is not that we don't have a basic consensus about what needs to be done, it's that of that 70%, too few are engaged in actually pushing hard. So let's, um, let's do our best to build as much of that kind of consensus as we possibly can. Um, and, uh, people ask if, uh, uh, if 350.org and other environmental organizations considered adding weapons divestment to their fossil fuel divestment campaign. Um, yeah, I, I, there's been a fair amount of that going on, and people are putting in other important things too, like private prisons um, and so on. Um, and and it's been good and useful where it's happened. Um, um, it, but it requires a lot of organizing. I, I'll just say that the fossil fuel divestment campaign took an extraordinary amount of work to make happen. And what was good about it was that it happened in thousands of places at once. Not everybody has a coal mine in their backyard, but everybody has access to some pot of money, the university endowment, a church fund, a pension fund, um, and those all became locuses for the fight. I, I'm not really, I mean, the, the, the fossil fuel divestment campaign is now sort of just running on its own momentum. And most of, the, most of it's been accomplished. As I say, we're at $40 trillion now. Um, and so we're focused now on the sort of next set of campaigns around banks and things. But divestment might be a good strategy to think about uh, uh, on weapon stuff, just for the reason that I've been um, outlining here, uh, that it can happen in lots of places at once. And so involves lots of people in the work, if you see what I mean. And I'm not sure if there are other questions that I didn't um, get to here. If there are, people should just wave their hand and ask them or type them in again or something. Glad to see that in Philly, they're getting the city to divest from nuclear funds and uh, nuclear weapons in the city retirement fund. It seems wise on many counts, especially for the city of Brotherly Love. Well, um, they've beaten you all into submission. Uh -huh. um, well, I do see a question from Greta. Um, did we hear this one yet? I don't think so. Um, weapons divest the... I think that's what I was just talking yeah, about. Yeah, okay. Probably inarticulately, but... Uh, okay. I didn't know if you had addressed that one. Yeah. Um, well... I just really want to say thanks to you all for all the work that you've been doing. And it's obviously work you've been doing a long time with great effect and with great power and emphasis. And I know how hard that kind of work is and I'm extremely grateful for it. And I hope that um, if you're interested in these, in the kind of fossil fuel end of this, that you'll figure out some ways to join in with these campaigns we're doing at Third Act, even there may not be anybody on this call who's 
quite of the right age yet, but we'll let you join in a little, even if you're not 60 yet. Um, um, and, and, and strike a blow against the fossil fuel world in that way too. Um, um, it's, it's, it's all important work that we are up to. And I, I just I couldn't be more grateful uh, uh, for all the work that you accomplished uh, on this joint task. And um, I will look forward to seeing you in person down the road at some point. Um, 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 and in the meantime, just really do accept my thanks and enjoy. I know you've got real work to do now in breakout rooms and things and stuff to get down to, but it's been very kind of you to um, to uh, uh, bear with me for an hour, and I've enjoyed it mightily. So good night, y'all, and God bless. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, so now we are going to go to breakout rooms. We have about 40 minutes to go into breakout rooms. And um, I'd like to invite Al and David to explain the rooms that you'll be facilitating. After you, Al. <laughs> All right. Thanks, David. Uh, what we're going to do in the room we're breakout room we're calling the collaboration room is, is really is trying to the, the Florida Peace and Justice Alliance is that, an alliance of organizations and some individuals uh, working together, as Barbara mentioned at the outset of this meeting. Uh, so what we want to do is talk about collaboration and, and how, how can we better work together. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, as, as Bill McKibben said. And so we want to talk about, you know, what we can do as organizations and individuals to to collaborate so it's going to be a conversation and i hope you come join that breakout room with lots of ideas and enthusiasm and energy for what we can do as floridians that's my pitch david okay, so, so you're on i'm on <laughs> uh, in, in in our breakout room, we're going to be discussing uh, what we call in in my organization extreme lobbying. How we uh, make lobbying not only um, well. First of all, we're going to discuss why lobbying is important. A lot of people don't think it is, um, and the bottom line is everything we do is about changing policy. And if we get out in the streets, which we should do, and if we do these divestment campaigns, which we should do, what that does is it changes public opinion, and ultimately, what we have to do then is change policy. And what I'm going to be going over is how we make that effective and how to make it work. Um, so a little bit of nuts and bolts toward the end, but it's going to be more of a wide ranging discussion. And I look forward to having people um, to join me there. OK, great. I'm now going to open the rooms and then you all should see two options, either the lobbying room or the collaboration room, and then you should be able to click on the room. I will open them now. <laughs> 